Well, good evening, everyone. I announced that I was going to be talking tonight on the topic, Are We in the Last Days? I think anybody who has uh, young children probably have felt that way from the moment that you begin to see your children start, you know, grating on your nerves. There's all these passages in the Bible that people have gone to to say, this is a sign that the end is near. And I thought it would be a good time to address some of that. Let me tell you why. First, there's a war going on in Israel. Revelation chapter 20 speaks of a thousand years, and then Satan has to be set free for a short time. I'm just telling you what the text says. And in the short time of that release, Satan is described as the deceiver of the nations who will gather them from battle surrounding the city he loves. But then fire will come down from heaven to destroy them, and Satan is thrown into the fiery furnace, the earth flees, and judgment day occurs. Just a few chapters earlier, God unleashes seven bowls of wrath against those who have shed the blood of God's holy people, and the kings of the earth gather in a place called Armageddon. And Jerusalem figures prominently because in chapter 11 and verse 8 of Revelation, there are two witnesses who get slain, and their bodies lie in the city where the Lord was crucified. So I'm just giving you language that makes some people nervous when they hear there's a war in Israel. Number two, there are signs in the sky. Have you noticed? Not that long ago, we were able to enjoy, some of us were, I did not have the right glasses, the partial eclipse. You know what's going to happen in April, don't you? Did you know that in April... Arkansas is going to have what the state is calling the largest tourist event in the history of the state. There are churches in this area that are already planning and gearing up for tons of outsiders who are going to be coming to our town looking for places to park, needing places to use the restroom. And why? Because we are going to experience a total eclipse. In Luke 21... Jesus gives a prolonged speech that many Bibles title, quote, the end of the world, depending on what Bible you've got. Luke 21, verse 9, when you hear of wars and uprisings, don't be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places, and fearful events, and great signs in the sky. So there's that. Do you remember, when we talk about signs in the sky, that when we hear that, we probably don't think much. We, we think of signs in the sky as not that big a deal, but in that, those days... Signs in the sky were often considered as portents of upcoming tragedies. In fact, don't forget that when Christ appeared the first time, it was three priestly astrologers from the east who said, we saw not a star, but his star in the east. Signs in the sky involving stars or planets that signified the coming of the king. Third, we live in a time of great cultural upheaval. Has anybody noticed that? The Apostle Paul says to a young Timothy, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, not lovers of the good, but lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And Peter adds this, you must understand, 2 Peter 3 and verse 3, 
In the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. War in Israel, signs in the sky, cultural upheaval, and this is why there are people who are asking, are we in the last days? You ready for the answer? Yes, no, and yes. Let's go through it. If we were to take a poll of this congregation, over 600 folks, we'd find a wide variety of views, positions, and interpretations concerning Israel, the prophecies of Jesus, the millennial reign, what to expect before the end of time, and what will happen at the end of time. I would have guessed that before I took the job, but I will tell you, Having listened carefully to you and discussed some of these with some of you, I can assure you this is the case. So I want to provide, hopefully, some helpful parameters for our conversation. You know, if you ever read a big book on like all this stuff, what's going on with prophecy, what's the end of the world going to look like, nobody gets too upset if the introduction doesn't give all the answers, but it gives you sort of the playing field to have an honest conversation. Consider this lesson the introduction. I would love to do a 10-part series on what you might call end times, not just because it's interesting, but because when you think about the seven ones of Ephesians 4, the central truths of the faith, one of those is one hope. So it seems to me very important to have good conversations about what does it mean for the Lord to return and for us to be with Him forever. Not that we have to agree on all the details of it, but believing there's a hope to which we hold is one of the central truths of the Christian faith. But what I want to do tonight is just try to provide a sense of calm and a sense of overall general hope when you think about this kind of stuff. So, a couple of helpful points in the debate. Number one, know your history. In 365 AD, there was a French bishop named Hilary of Poitiers, and he told his church, the end of the world is gonna happen this year, 365. In 1346, the Black Death spread across Europe, and for the next four years, churches were announcing clearly, this is the end of the world. Michael Stefel was a mathematician who said Judgment Day was going to start at 8 a.m. on October 19th, 1533. In 1600, Martin Luther said that the end will occur no later than this date. He also said the Pope was the Antichrist, and the Pope said the Antichrist was Martin Luther. February 1st, 1624. London astrologers said they've calculated everything, and this will be the end of the world. Did you know Christopher Columbus wrote a book about this? He said it would be 1658. The Shakers was a group of believers who had their own views on things, and they said the end of the world would be in 1794. That was after they failed the prediction of 1792. John Wesley, one of my heroes, foresaw the millennium starting in the year 1836. And his interpretation of Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, was that this thousand year reign would happen between 1058 and 1836. If you're a mathematician, that's not a thousand years, but that's what he said. And he said, then Christ would come. The Millerites, followers of a guy named Miller, said it would happen on March 21st, 1844. When that didn't happen, they recalculated to October 22nd, 1844. And when that didn't happen, it ushered in, you can Google this, the Great Disappointment. In 1914, Charles Taze Russell said this is the date of the Great Battle. In 1941, the Jehovah's Witnesses were putting in all their literature that they were passing out. This is the year when the end comes. When that didn't happen, they recalibrated. And in the years 1966 to 1975, 
they were saying something very similar. Maybe you've heard the name Hal Lindsey. He wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. It was a huge bestseller in the late 70s and early 80s. Hal Lindsey said that Jesus would return within 40 years of the founding of Israel, 1948. So he predicted it would happen sometime before 1988. Speaking of 1988, that was a popular year. There was a former NASA employee named Edgar Wisenant. Maybe you remember this. He wrote a little book, and it was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Could Be in 1988. I can give you one reason why it wasn't. He said it would happen between September 11 and September 13. When that didn't happen, he revised quickly for a second edition and said it would be on October 3rd. When that didn't happen, the third edition came out saying, I, I missed the calculations. It's going to be September 30th, 1989. I want you to understand, I've just picked a couple of hundreds of these. And if you're thinking, well, will I be around to see it? Well, hey, you might be in luck. Ken Hovind uh, says that it's going to most likely happen in the year 2028. So mark your calendars. And if you're not too worried, David Powell says the earth and the moon are going to fall into the sun and the sun will be a red giant. And that's going to happen in the year 7.59 billion. So nothing to worry about yet. There's been a history of people who have either tried to calculate scriptures or look for signs, and they've predicted, and the predictions have failed. Speaking of knowing your history, you should know the wide history of our own movement. Remember I mentioned the thousand years of Revelation 20? What does that mean? There are three major views. There are premillennials who think that Christ will come before that reign, there are post-millennials, which means that Christ comes after that reign. There are amillennials, which means that we're in that reign, but it's not an indefinite period of time. In our own movement, Walter Scott, Barton Stone, and James Harding were premillennial. Alexander Campbell was post-millennial. Leo Bowles, Boy Wallace were amillennial. My favorite line is G.C. Brewer. They asked him what he was, and he said, I'm a pan-millennialist. They said, what does that mean? He says, I think it's all going to pan out in the end. The fact that there have been so many predictions give me pause. The fact that there's such a wide variety in our movement gives me cause for reflection and learning. And the fact that we've all changed our minds on some things in our life gives me grace for others. I don't personally believe that there's going to be something called the rapture. You can read about it. It's a view that says that one day, without people really even realizing it, Christians will be snatched up, seized up, snatched and taken by force up into heaven for a period of time. I don't really believe in the rapture. But I always remember this interesting line. Mike Cope is the one who shared this. He was a young preacher in North Carolina. He was early 20s. And he said he was going to be on TV with a bunch of other preachers to answer Bible questions, which you give to 24-year-olds, of course. And he said he was getting all ready for it. And uh, he had even brought his Greek lexicon. He was going to show off. He'd been learning Greek. And the first question they gave him was, discuss the rapture. And he said on TV, I want you to know there's not a single verse in the Bible that says anything like Christians are going to be sneezed, uh, sneezed up, snatched up, seized, taken by force. And he said, in fact, the verse most often used is 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and verse 17. And the Greek word there says harpazo. And I got my Greek lexicon here. Let's just look at it. Harpazo says to be seized, snatched out, taken away, or carried off by force. And then he stopped and he said, see, it's not even in there. You know. In other words, once you have your conclusion set, Anything you see has to either fit your conclusion or you won't listen to it. All of that gives me pause. Knowing your history tells me don't share your view too strongly or too loudly. You might be wrong and the person sitting next to you might be able to show that to you. Don't sarcastically belittle a view that you've heard too quickly. The person sitting next to you might hold that view sincerely and have some great Christian leaders who can back them up. 
And be humble with your view. People in the past have felt just as strongly as you, many of whom have been proven wrong. Keep that in mind. So, know your history. Number two, appreciate apocalyptic genre. Language in apocalyptic is not always literal. What's apocalyptic? Apocalyptic is larger than life language. You know the Bible has different genres. You know this. Somebody writes you a love letter and they say, you know, uh, roses are red and violets are blue. And you stop them and say, well, actually, I can show you some violets that aren't blue. And you say, you've missed the point. It's poetry. Apocalyptic is larger than life language. Isaiah chapter 13 is an apocalyptic chapter. Verses 9 through 10 of Isaiah 13 talks about how the sun will stop shining. The moon will stop uh, being in the sky. It'll all come down out of the skies. You're thinking, wow, that hasn't happened yet. When that's gonna ha- when's that going to happen? Well, here's the fact. It already did. Because the heading of Isaiah 13 will tell you he's talking about the fall of the city of Babylon happened a long time ago. That was a way of describing how the events of that day would be larger than life. It's kind of like, I've used this illustration before, it's kind of like when you're a teenager and you break up with someone. You can write, today we broke up. But that's not what you write in your journal. What you say is, it's the end of the world. You use bigger than life language to say this event has bigger significance than just the simple words. So language is not always literal. Number two, application is not always modern. Mark 13, Jesus is speaking and it's very cryptic. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it doesn't belong, let the reader understand Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And I'm thinking, Mark, this is why I'm reading you, because I don't understand. Your job is to explain it to me. He doesn't. Luke comes along, and Luke gives the same sermon, but he seems to explain what Mark leaves cryptic. You know what Luke's gospel says? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of Dodge. It turns out that's what Mark was trying to say, but he says it so cryptically. Sometimes, when Mark 13 looks very cryptic, Luke says actually it probably refers to what's happening here in just a few years uh, of his own day. Matthew 24 comes along, and depends on which scholar you talk to, some think Matthew 24 is, can be split right in half, and that the first half of the book of the chapter is about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and the second half is about the end of the world. It depends on who you're asking. But what I'm getting at is that some think it's talking about the the fall of the city then. Some think it's about the end of time. And the fact is they both have interesting points. Language is not always literal. Application is not always modern. And timing is not always straightforward. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says, I'm writing things that must soon take place. It's been 2,000 years since the book was written. Things that must soon take place. At the end of the book, he says, Behold, I am coming soon. What does soon mean? If you're thinking, well, maybe it's elastic, but not too elastic, do you realize the same language is used in Ezekiel and Hosea? What does soon mean? Well, it means different things depending upon the context. You know that. You know when your kid calls you and they've been staying out too late. You say, when are you coming home? And they say, soon. You know that means, who knows? James 5 and verse 9, James says, Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he says, You want to know what's going to happen at the end? You all who have died, you're going to meet the Lord in the air. You're going to rise. But we who are alive will meet the Lord in the air. Notice how he puts himself, not in the category of those who will have died, but in the category of we who are alive, which makes me think he might have thought it's going to happen like next Thursday. Doesn't say, though. In fact, when you ask, are we in the last days, the Bible actually says yes. But do you realize we've been in the last days since the Lord came back? 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Peter says, What's happening today on Pentecost fulfills the prophecy of Hosea about what will happen in the last days. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 says, In these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. James 5 and verse 3 says, All you who have treasured up money for yourself, you've treasured up treasures in the last days. And in 2 Timothy 3, Paul says, In the last days... Some will have all kinds of issues, avoid such people. Why would you tell someone to avoid such people if it was thousands of years ahead? Apocalyptic genre is not always literal. The timing is not always straightforward. The next thing I'd like you to consider is understand the theological take on Israel. There are some people who think that in Scripture... God has a plan for physical Israel, that he had it in the Old Testament, he's put it on hold, and then at the end of time, he's going to go back to deal with his covenant with physical Israel. It's called two-covenant theology. There's a second view, and that is God had a plan for Israel, but now he's replaced that plan with the church. And so when you find language in the New Testament about Israel, what that means is it's being fulfilled as the church. That's called replacement theology. There's a third view that says Israel is still the chosen people, but God's going to graft Gentiles into that covenant community, and Israel must come to believe in Jesus in order to be fully chosen. How's that going to happen? The answer is, near the end of time, there's going to be a mass conversion of Jewish people. You can find biblical verses, I'm not saying biblical support, you can find biblical verses for all three of those views. So may I suggest, be humble about how you speak about Israel. Be cautious before jumping on a bandwagon. Realize there are believers in Christ on both sides of that conflict right now. And then finally, don't be afraid. This is the big one. I can't tell you how many books about the end times have in the title something about Antichrist. Have you heard this? Did you know that there are books that talk about, like, Antichrist, a study of Revelation? Did you know Revelation never mentions an Antichrist? Antichrist appears in John's language, but not Revelation. It's in 1 John, and it's in 2 John. There's no Antichrist in Revelation. And when it shows up in 1 John and 2 John, John says, you've heard the Antichrist is coming. Can I let you in on a little secret? There are many of them, and many of them have already come. I think when we fear Antichrists more than we have confidence in Christ, we've missed the point. In the New Testament, when the Bible talks about the second coming, they talk about confidence. 1 John 4 and verse 18. Perfect love casts out fear. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 7, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And then 1 John 4 and verse 4, He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Here's my takeaway. There may be some wide perspectives on whether there will be signs in the sky. There may be wide perspective on whether a war in Israel is actually part of the end times scenario. There may be difference in our, among us about whether there will, has been, or is something like a thousand year reign. But may I suggest, with humility, hold your view with a sense of confidence that Christ is king and that he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world and don't add to hysteria that tends to happen when people miss the point. My favorite sermon I've ever heard was called The World's Last Day, and it concluded by saying, I think the world's last day will be very much like today, and I would like to live today as if it was the last day. I hope that brings some comfort and and hope to you. Let's pray. God, we love you. We praise your name. We ask you to give us confidence in you. Fathers, we seek to understand better and to read our Bibles better as we dig deeper into prophecy and seek to understand what was going on then and what's going on now. Help us to express our views with humility, with grace. Help us seek first to understand and help us remember whatever the case, we have nothing to fear because of our confidence in you. Father, let us live with expectation 
that you coming is a good thing and that we being ready to meet you is a sign that we ought to be living our lives in holiness and righteousness and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, y'all, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word.